from the Casbah in Tunis to Tahrir Square in Cairo. Kill us! Egyptians, kill us! From inside Madrid's Puerta del Sol to outside St. Paul's Cathedral in London. From Wall Street in New York to Main Street just about anywhere. We are living in a new age of protest. But dissent isn't always about the masses. Sometimes it's a singular and solitary struggle. In last week's episode of the Oracles of Pennsylvania Avenue. About 9.20, a call came in that stated a gentleman had drove a, a truck up to the base of Monument. He said that he was going to blow up the Washington Monument if uh, the media didn't devote its airtime to the issue of nuclear weapons. I felt at that time that the greatest threat facing humanity was nuclear weapons. So I, I decided then to return to uh, D.C. Then I realized that there was a lot of traffic going through Lafayette Park, and so I figured, well, I'll just sit down here and, until uh, I can think of something better to do. Well, I came here from New York in the 70s. Thomas was there. He had a two signs protesting nuclear. I called this, what you call the White House, I called in the head, the head of the octopus and the tentacles all over the world. It was a very creative time. There was this huge flurry of sign building going on in, at that time. There were other people also in the park, and there was a little village being built. It was sign alley up and down the, <coughs> the park, you know, the cent center of the park and the edge of the park. And it was very lively, and, and music, there was lots of music. And, and people were there around the clock, and it got kind of like a carnival atmosphere, sort of. It was, it was quite delightful. Being out there in the park, you run the gamut of human emotions. Some people hug you. I'm going to make an obscene gesture. All right, let's do that. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Uh, some people slug you. So you're, you're I've been punched out a couple of times at least a couple of times. But I think the biggest problem really is the police. But again, it's sort of kind of funny because I, on, on numerous occasions, I've had policemen arrest me one day and then come back the next day and apologize. Oh, gee, Mr. Thomas, we wouldn't have, been, we wouldn't have done that except uh, we were following orders, which is where I got the sneaky suspicion that there might be some kind of conspiracy going on or something. Until I joined the vigil, my experience with police was basically to flirt with them. Um, but after I joined the vigil, I had a rude awakening because I discovered that uh, as long as, you know, you're an ordinary looking, ordinary acting citizen, then they like to flirt. But if you're somebody who looks a little different or acts a little different, then, then they don't feel so comfortable with you anymore. And my first experience with a police officer was to, was to be kicked awake by a police officer who came rushing in with a club. And uh, he was just really violent with a whole lot of people. And I had my camera and, and was taking pictures. And he, he saw what I was doing and he turned on me and kicked the camera away from me and threw me to the ground and stood on me. And we, there were a bunch of us arrested. I made friends with a lot of police over the years. They'd stop and talk. But when they got orders, then they'd come and arrest. The, there was this desire by the White House, implemented by the Department of Interior, to 
rid Lafayette Park of its uh, rodents and other scum. <laughs> So they wrote lots of regulations to try to get, to get us out of there, and uh, the one that was the most effective was the no camping regulation. Lafayette Park is a, a people park. It's a park to sit out, enjoy the sun, to eat your lunch, watch the birds, look at the White House, observe traffic going by. You can visit the park, you can uh, be in the park, you can enjoy the park, but you cannot live in the park. The park was not designed uh, for any type of camping. And so I ended up going to prison in 1988 for uh, camping. But we got arrested for allegedly camping, which we weren't doing uh, at all. Judge Charles Ritchie uh, originally ruled in our favor because we filed motions to acquit us on the grounds that we were exercising our religious beliefs under the First Amendment. Several weeks later, this cop comes up on his little motor scooter and he says, uh, that was pretty clever, Mr. Thomas. I said, what? He said that motion. I said, no, that wasn't clever. I was, I was just telling him the truth. He said, no, that was pretty clever. But I'll tell you what, you're not going to get away with that again. Uh, some of his colleagues cornered Judge Ritchie in the uh, cafeteria and straightened him out on that. And then the Court of Appeals reversed him and said he had to take us to trial. We got convicted by Judge Ritchie. And then at the end, he said, my hands are tied. I know your cause is noble. And I know you're going to come right back out here and do what, you're going, what you've been doing is when you come out. But we hope that by sending you to prison, it will deter others from adopting your lifestyle. So there were several of us who went to prison for two months, and Thomas and I went for three months. For a long time, the, the judges, even if they convicted us, which often they wouldn't, would refuse to send us to jail. But after Judge Ritchie sent us to prison in 1988, then we started losing in various ways. There was an order that came down from uh, one of the judges to the, to the Department of Interior saying, uh, why are you wasting our time? These people aren't doing anything wrong. And he said that uh, they had been told that, that it had cost them a million dollars or something like that. The reason that we are um, tolerated now is simply because it was too expensive <laughs> to fight us. The Washington Monument tonight still under siege. A strange and frightening drama continues to unfold at the Washington Monument. It was a bizarre episode from the start. A man in a jumpsuit and a motorcycle helmet threatening to blow up the Washington Monument, apparently in the name of nuclear peace. The tense standoff drags on throughout the afternoon. The man behind the mask insisted on talking only with reporters, and Associated Press writer Steve Comerow made several trips up the hill under a white handkerchief. Well, I remember it was a long day. I went back and forth and back and forth, uh, bringing his messages uh, back to the police and bringing their messages to him. He had driven a van up to the Washington Monument and was saying that it was filled with dynamite. and he was going to blow it up unless the media broadcast his proposal. 
and a list of demands was finally released and read by a police spokesman. Among them, a national dialogue on nuclear weapons and that TV stations must broadcast the dialogue daily. An anti-nuclear book called Fate of the Earth is to be used as some sort of guide and the author of the book warns, because we now have the ability to destroy life itself, we have a moral imperative to achieve nuclear disarmament. He reinstated that we needed to make those arrangements immediately if we didn't want this detonated. There was no chance that he was going to blow down the Washington Monument as he threatened to do. Uh, the Washington Monument is a big, heavy thing with walls, you know, as thick as a room. To my best recollection, I remembered when I used to work there as a footman, I could recall that there were the monument 555 feet and the walls were 15 foot thick. And a bomb outside of it is just not going to blow it down. I mean, unless it's a nuclear bomb or something, ironically. So they weren't worried about that. Um, what they were worried about at first was there were people inside of the monument, tourists in a park, uh, ranger type. So my concern was what technique or strategy can we use to coax him or convince him to uh, let the hostages go free. Camaro meets again and again with Mayer trying to gain his confidence. I was like trying to change the subject. I was trying to get him to talk about himself and this is one of the techniques that the police suggested. But he just wouldn't go there. He wanted to talk about the nuclear freeze movement. This was obviously his uh, reason to live. That, you know, at first we wanted to be sure they knew who he was. We didn't know because he had this motorcycle helmet and visor, so you couldn't really view who had all of this on. Later in the day, after negotiation, a member that demonstrated with him in front of the White House had seen this uh, incident on television. My friend is watching the TV, and uh, he said, look at this, look at this. I said, what? He said, somebody is at the Washington Monument, and they're gonna blow it up. I said, oh yeah? And I did go back out and started painting the signs again until it occurred to me, shit, he's down there all by himself, you know? I, I can't just leave him there. So I ran all the way down there. And I knew all the cops, and he knew me. And he said, oh, Mr. Thomas, so glad to see you. Come on, we gotta talk to this guy. And he came over and requested of us if he could go up and talk to Norman Mayer. And uh, we said, well, we think it's him, but we don't know for sure. And I said, I I'm just gonna stand over here on the side, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's all right, let's stand on the side. So uh, I just walked through their perimeter. I mean, they got these guys with guns all around, but they're like 20 feet away from each other, you know? So I just walked through them. And, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas, come back, come back. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll be right back just a second. I gotta talk to this guy. So, uh, you know, they're afraid to do anything. So anyway, I went up and he said, uh, no, this isn't your shtick, this is my shtick. Your thing is to stay in front of the White House. As long as you're there, they can't totally ignore their insanity. So you gotta stay there, I'm doing this. Till he came back, we were not able to validate that we were in fact dealing with Nor uh, Norman Mayer. But there was also uh, an effort to figure out exactly how he was operating. I go back down the hill and the cops jump on me. Does he have any dynamite? I said, I don't know, I couldn't see inside the truck. Well, do you think he does? I said, I don't know. With the binoculars and the capability that we had, we could not identify the electronic uh, instrument. He was saying that he had a, a remote control that he could detonate the dynamite. So the police wanted me to, to get close enough to him to identify the remote control, exactly what type it was, and then they would have a chance to jam it. And as a result of that, we were able to identify the uh, the instrument as a Fataba. It's a uh, remote control used usually for model airplanes. That can detonate a dynamite or any other explosive and had been used in the past. They were trying to figure that out. I don't know how far they got with that exactly. He happened to have a small TV, Norman did. 
So he was able to validate that we were following his request. So he agreed to let them go. The negotiations resulted in the release five hours after the siege started of the nine people at the top of the monument. I just couldn't wait for it to be over. And I remember I was the last one out, and I was just thinking, this is almost over. Just, you're almost there. And they, they filed out. And uh, that was gratifying to me, you know, that we were able to get that done. And then it was just sort of me and him. I was much relieved as the chief because I knew at least the uh, hostages were safe. But still, I had a critical situation. Mayor still holds his finger on the detonator. If he detonated the dynamite and it went off, I mean, we were concerned about the damage or missiles that could go even to the White House. Police blocked off the area, snarling traffic. At sunset, workers and holiday shoppers were still trying to get home, making the rush hour even more of a misery than usual. Late afternoon passes. Night falls. It appears the negotiators and everyone else involved are in for a long night. The National Weather Service says the temperature tonight will go down to about 32 degrees. Whoever this man is at the Washington Monument, apparently he's prepared to stay for a while. After his last conversation with that reporter from the Associated Press, he said, see you tomorrow. The Academic and Strategic Alliance program involves many universities in this country and training foreigners to develop and understand and comprehend nuclear weapons. Why on earth they're doing it, God only knows. One of the reasons is because they're losing people to develop nuclear weapons because the old fellows who did it years ago in the Manhattan Project, they're dying out. They've trained a few more, but it's sort of not sexy anymore. So they, they therefore are allocating large amounts of money to universities, University of Chicago and you know, the universities that are training our children to earn a living to teach them how to make nuclear bombs to kill themselves. Um, and I see that program as absolutely contraindicated in terms of education of our children and to allow foreign citizens like Pakistanis and Indians and the like, to learn the techniques to make nuclear weapons just fosters lateral proliferation of nuclear weapons and hence it is more likely that the world will end in one nuclear war. With the Cold War being over, the threat of nuclear weapons still hangs over us like a dark mushroom cloud. And while my colleagues, our colleagues, are taking care of building more nuclear weapons, I'm pleased to be signing on as a co-sponsor of Delegate Norton's uh, Nuclear Disarmament and Economic Conversion Act of 1999. And if it doesn't pass this year, I'll sign on it the next Congress, and the next Congress, and the next Congress, until it will. And I ask the question constantly, is this the world we want our children to live in? If we are serious about taking care of our children, we must start by eliminating nuclear weapons and leaving behind a legacy of peace, not fear. And we must do it now. Proposition 1 is uh, something that I got involved with virtually because of kids. During the, during the springtime, there's lots of class trips to Washington, D.C., where the high school kids come down. And a lot of kids would say to me, well, what you're doing is pretty cool, but if you really want to make change, you have to work within the system. Well, I don't believe in the system, but I figured you can't leave any stone unturned. For the first few years, we passed out a lot of flyers talking about what it was that we wanted to achieve, but there didn't seem to be any particular vehicle for getting there. 
1986, a person by the name of Dr. Charles Hyder came to Lafayette Park to fast for global nuclear disarmament, and he was a very large astrogeophysicist from New Mexico. And he was on a fast for a very, very long time, and he lost a huge amount of weight. And during that time, a lot of people became quite interested in what was going on in the park because he had credentials and he had friends. And his friends were pretty good at, uh, at popularizing or telling people about what was going on. And so we sat down together and drafted a petition to Congress calling for a constitutional amendment for global nuclear disarmament. And it was called the Hyder Amendment. Uh, when Dr. Hyder's fast ended and he left uh, and went back to New Mexico, we continued circulating the petition and it was extremely popular. So that was when the idea of Proposition 1 was born. I came up with this idea to do this uh, initiative here in D.C. And what they did was classically what America is all about. They sat down and without going to a bunch of experts, they wrote out what they wanted the people to vote on. In 1991, actually, we went through the process of filing the application and, and argued with the lawyer who said it wasn't an appropriate thing to bring to the voters. and. We had a lawyer who argued on our behalf and won, and they issued us the petitions and we were going to start our campaign, and then the first Gulf War started. So we, we dropped that particular campaign and we devoted 40 days and 40 nights to beating on drums and fighting the war in Iraq, along with a lot of other people. Once that was over, then we started the process again, and we brought the idea to the voters finally in 1993 as Initiative 37, and won the election with 56% of the vote. We won, overwhelmingly, despite the fact that we did it on $600. The Washington Post, the Washington Times, and just about every news channel trashed us. So we won the election and uh, Congresswoman Norton met with us. But Eleanor Holmes Norton began opposed to the idea. When I look closely at it, I'm a constitutional lawyer and I saw that it was for a constitutional amendment. Now, we don't want constitutional amendments except for matters involving overarching issues, mostly matters involving our rights. After the election, she compromised. We compromised, she compromised. And together, we worked out the present bill. And so we got the Nuclear Disarmament Economic Conversion Act. It calls on the United States government to promise the world, we'll get rid of all our nuclear weapons if everybody else does. To convert its uh, nuclear weapons uh, and their cost to domestic needs. Including health care and housing and education and food and environmental restoration. And in recent years, it has a clause saying uh, renewable energy resources. Uh, I put in the first bill in 1994, I believe, and every two years since. And citizens really need to understand that the fact that a bill doesn't get out of committee doesn't mean very much. Uh, that doesn't mean the democracy has failed. What my citizens have done is look for openings. They don't claim that they've captured the imagination of uh, the country or, or certainly not of the world, but they do know that somebody has to sound the alarm and that alarms are usually not sounded by mass movements. Alarms are sounded by small movements which then become mass movements. And the rest is, if not history, we think history in the making. Thank you.
So I bring you greetings from our relatives across the sea, from the Peace Park anti-nuclear vigilers, of whom I am one. Let's make nuclear disarmament the law. 187 countries have promised to abolish nuclear weapons, but they haven't set a date. Our purpose here is to make it happen, to make global nuclear disarmament the law. 81. In 1995, Congresswoman Norton wrote a letter to the World Court during the time that the World Court was deliberating on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, asking them to take note that the United States Congress was considering a bill for global nuclear disarmament. And I was uh, sent there by friends to present this to the World Court however I could, which happened through Zimbabwe. As a result of the World Court finding that the threat of use of nuclear weapons is illegal, even though they have no way of enforcing it, nevertheless it brings the idea up to a higher level of awareness among all of the, all of the diplomats. The rest of the world understands it. They do understand it. He is still there, pacing the grounds around the 555-foot monument as he has all day long. All of his threats have been delivered in even measured tones. Since about 9.30 this morning, a man saying he wants a national dialogue on avoiding nuclear war has threatened to blow up the monument. Mayor is demanding that the U.S. government and all other governments disarm. Spotlights illuminate the monument. Tensions rise. Police and FBI agents have been conducting indirect negotiations thus far with limited effect. As you can see, it is now dark here in Washington and the stalemate continues. During the negotiation period, he would afterwards go back, sometimes to the back of the end of the vehicle, and look like he was talking to someone. And another time, he did that from the driver's side, like he was talking to someone, looking into the vehicle. The cops jumped on me. Is there anybody with him? I said, I don't know. He, he did say he was communicating with the truck. Communicating with the truck? I said, yeah, this sounds a little strange, doesn't it? So we thought assuredly that he had an accomplice in the back of the vehicle. The last meeting that uh, Steve Kamara had with him in negotiating, he said he didn't want to talk anymore, that uh, he wanted to see if we were going to keep our promises with the newspaper and the media and that he would get back with us in the morning. So we're kind of settling down for the evening. Uh, I didn't know if he'd want to talk to me again or anything else, but the police wanted me to stay. And uh, it was getting dark. And the evening newscasts were pretty much wrapped up. And he got crankier. It, late in the day, he had he had the radio in the truck and stuff, so he was aware of, of the news reporting. And I think he was unhappy that the issue was him and the siege, and the issue wasn't nuclear freeze. It appeared to some that he watched the evening news on a portable TV set, and a few minutes after the news was over, he began to back his truck away from the monument. I used the football field concept, and I said to the snipers that if he starts moving, he will not reach the 50-yard line. When the truck began to move toward downtown Washington and the White House, it was then that the shooting began. Police snipers with night scopes opened fire. Mayor is hit in a hail of bullets. The truck overturns. It was a little confusing. It was hard to figure out what had happened at first, you know, because I wasn't, I wasn't looking at him at the time. I was in the, in the hut at the bottom of the hill. And, uh, I went rushing outside. There was a report that possibly another man had escaped from the van and ran into the Washington Monument. So we were still concerned that that guy had explosives on him with a backpack and he in fact could still explode the dynamite. 
Tear gas was fired into the Washington Monument in a step-by-step -step search for a second man. But there was no one else. Norman Mayer acted on his own. But we still didn't know if, um, if there were any explosives there or not. The dogs were sent up to the truck to sniff it for bombs, and one of them had a positive result. And of course, that got everybody nervous. The SWAT team inches closer in an armored personnel carrier. Then Major Ron Miller and his men move in cautiously on foot. One of our counter-sniper people could report with their telescopic lens that uh, it did appear that Mr. Mayor was still alive. I approached the driver's side. I grabbed uh, his hand because it looked like he could reach the transmitter. While I was with Mr. Mayor, he said uh, two different times, uh, they shot me in the head. They shot me in the head. Norman Mayer dies moments later. His truck is empty. It is all a bluff. The siege is over at the Washington Monument. Nuclear reactors were first designed to fission uranium to make plutonium. When you put uranium in a nuclear reactor and it fission spontaneously, it produces 200 new radioactive elements. Um, they're potent carcinogens, huge quantities of liquid, high-level Devastatingly dangerous, toxic radioactive waste now exists mostly at Hanford, Washington and in Savannah River, South Carolina. And as these radioactive materials, all of them migrate, they bioconcentrate thousands of times at each step of the food chain, the algae, the crustaceans, the little fish, the big fish, the lobsters and us. Now it's still being produced for bombs. They don't know what to do with it. They say that they can store it safely. They are kidding themselves. They are lying. It's just a biological and medical catastrophe which will be bequeathed by us to all our descendants for the rest of time. That's what making the bombs means. So we made the bombs to kill ourselves, to kill ourselves better. It was a strange chapter in the history of the nation's capital, the Washington Monument held hostage. It ended last night when four police bullets hit an anti-nuclear war protester as he drove off in what appeared to be a kind of rolling time bomb. He was bluffing. Norman Mayer, a 66-year-old handyman, galvanized the city by holding the Washington Monument hostage with a toy and an empty truck. Mayer was shot to death in the process. You know, the story ended so tragically because he, he, he obviously wasn't listening to the police. He tried to drive away. They, they shot him. A bullet hole in the marble-faced granite, a broken flagpole, and a notice at the entrance. The only signs left for tourists to point to of the monument siege. It was a bluff, an empty threat. When the truck pulled up to the monument, there was no TNT inside. The Washington Monument was closed this morning so that cleanup crews and souvenir hunters could clear away the remainders of last night's fatal incident. But far more difficult to clear away were the questions surrounding the shooting of Norman Mayer. This guy in fatigues comes running up, snaps his heels, just like a Nazi. You know. sir, sir, the marks were in place and ready, sir! <clears throat> pivots on his heel and goes running back off. This is like 9 o'clock in the morning. So they had this in, in the works well before. And then the police coming again from the back on the Secret Service. Well, he's dead. But I don't really, I don't really question the police. Ha, 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 ha. Start laughing. I said, who is dead? Well, he was not going to give you any more papers to distribute. They knew. So I think they, they were shooting to stop him. I think they shot him in the head four times, and uh, once in the shoulder. I don't know. I, I hope they didn't get that guy a medal. I, I, I don't know that they were shooting to kill him. The official story was that they were 
aiming for his tires. The truck was the target. Not the man. Not the man. It turned out there was nothing dangerous in the truck. I mean, they should have been able to tell because the truck was empty. You know, I mean, if he had a ton of dynamite, it would have been riding a little lower. That particular truck that he owns, he lined it with steel to make sure that it would withstand uh, a nuclear blast. We, uh, in searching the vehicle, discovered that he had a uh, steel plate welded to the vehicle so that uh, the people that are so-called experts in vehicle displacement advised us that he could, in fact, have approximately 1,000 pounds of weight in that vehicle. Number two, we had uh, were able to validate that he had tried to purchase uh, dynamite in the state of Kentucky. This guy had been very meticulous in doing everything to thoroughly convince us. So Norman Mayer had carried everything out just as if he had been a director of a movie. There was no way you could have arrived in any other decision. If he left the monument grounds, then I really would have had a mobile time bomb. And I remember him being buried there. I can't speak for others. It certainly didn't bother me at all. A, a, a veteran should have a right to be buried at Arlington, uh, regardless of whether in later life uh, he or she has uh, no longer followed the normal rules. I don't think it was right. That's just a personal opinion of my own. I don't think he should have been buried there with all those other patriots. I spent four years in the Marine Corps, uh, one year in Vietnam. Being a combat veteran, I guess personally, I have a feeling of ambivalence. The one side of me, that I wished he hadn't been buried there. But the other side, the rational side, when I think about who would I be to have him refuse his own constitutional right when I spent 30 some years defending the Constitution and people's rights, I would be a big hypocrite. I've thought about him a lot over the, over the years. It was just odd for me because since I, I knew the guy, uh, I called the police and I must, it must have gotten on the police scanner or something. And so uh, all these reporters started to call me. He was, he was holding the, the Washington Monument hostage all day long. It was actually still happening that night uh, when Nightline went on, which is what I was on. I was actually sitting next to Marion Barry. And I was, I don't know what I was, uh, 21 years old, I probably looked 16, and the mayor of Washington turned to me and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I explained and I, you know, Ted Koppel asked me the questions and I answered them um, and just told people how I knew uh, Norman Mayer, uh, but it ended up uh, actually getting me my first real job in Washington, D.C. because uh, my local congressman had seen it and said, and I applied for a job, he said, well, you did well on that, so you can come work for me uh, as well. So I guess I owe Norman uh, an awful lot. I haven't gone back to the monument since, well, not back inside. Um, I don't know if it's an aversion or something, but I, I haven't. Uh, it has, sort of, it does bring back some memories. You know, it's just such an odd thing. People, people tended to remember this jacket I was wearing, at least my friends did, and, and relatives, because uh, every time I walked up there, he would make me open my jacket like this to see if, uh, the police had given me a weapon or something like that. You know, it's, it's kind of green. So, you know, as you, as you get older, you don't wear these colors quite so bright, I guess. But it's, it's, it's kind of a funny thing. But, I, you know, I, it was sort of squirreled away, but I still have it. I can't bring myself to throw on it out. I still have a picture, a mugshot of Norman Mayer in my bureau dresser. Any law enforcement officer that takes a life will impact you for the rest of your life. It's never the same. You are a different person. That's something that I had to do 
It's a decision I had to make. And uh, I think, you know, that as an accountable person, I didn't have any other choice. I have to rationalize and justify that in my mind. Otherwise, uh, you know, you couldn't live with yourself. Maybe Norman Mayer never had a chance to be heard. Maybe he became a criminal because he couldn't be heard. What matters is that he wanted to tell us that humanity is drifting toward nuclear war. Perhaps this is a cry only lunatics and outlaws can hear. It would not be the first time truth had failed to get the establishment to listen, or the foolish had been chosen to confound the wise. The wise yesterday were rattling their sabers in Moscow, or putting the finishing touches in the House of Representatives on a military budget of $231 billion for the coming year. This is the wisdom of the world which proved too much for Norman Mayer, who wanted only to stop the arms race. Lunacy? Yes. But it is the lunacy of nations today who hold the world hostage, as he did Washington, with the threat of violence for the sake of peace. He died unheeded by them, but the star of his own television special. Such was the final lunacy. His pathetic charade received far more time from the media than we'll give the dialogue on nuclear issues, which he was crazy enough to think we might honor. When I think of uh, Bill Thomas and Concepcion, what they do and what they've done all these years, you'd have to think, well, those people are nuts. They're crazy. Well, if you think about it, police officers are almost total psychotics in other people's estimation. Because when there's danger, most people run away from it, where we run toward it. It's not easy to stand down there and walk and demonstrate and withstand the heat, the rain, the cold. How many people could endure something like that, even if it was a, a paid job? A lot of times people come by and ask me whether I think I'm making it. There have been lots of people who have come up to us and said, what are you achieving? How, how can you get anything done here? Why don't you go get a job? Why don't you do something from the inside? Uh, on an individual case-by-case -case basis, I think I'm making a difference. There are three million people who come to see Lafayette Park each year, according to the National Park Service. And of course, we don't talk to three million people, but a lot of them see the signs and we talk to a lot of people. So I think it's very effective. You know, if you, for somebody who has no money, how else are you gonna advertise? How else are you gonna get your point across? I, I believe that if the vigil were to disappear, it would be a great tragedy because it brings hope to people. And I've been told that so many times. But also, we have educated people. We've shared information with people that they wouldn't otherwise get. And we've been able to promote Proposition 1 with people from all over the country and all over the world. Proposition will never become a piece of legislation until we educate the Joe Sixpacks out in America and the Mrs. Joe Sixpacks when they know what danger they're under with the weapons facing off against each other. That's when Proposition 1 will happen. It will never happen without having the people behind it. Never. The anti-nuclear White House people who stand out there, rain, shine, snow and freezing, and they've been there for many years. My heart goes out to them. They're true and noble heroes of this country. Their time will come. They should make a statue of them. Put it in front of the White House. Tourists come to D.C. to learn about the country, and, and they're kind of part of history now. You know, if anybody deserves a place in heaven, that would be my mom. She's a very kind, strong woman who has really deep principles. She loves the world and wants to make it a better place. Thomas and Concepcion are, are very unique individuals. They are the strongest and most stubborn people I ever met. I have the deepest love and respect for Concepcion. And Thomas, of course, is my other half. I'm incomplete without him. 
he lives, he, he breathes what he believes in. That, that, that's what spurns him on. That's, and, and that's why he will continue to do what he's doing, uh, you know, even if the last nuclear arm in the world is destroyed. Uh, he's, he's not going to move. He'll, he'll be there. I think that we're on a razor's edge. There are some real bad people, but they're few. And if we stop working for them, and we stop listening to them, then humanity will make it. What I fear the most is that people won't wake up and realize that everybody on Earth is our family.